United Nations have delivered Europe from the Nazis. Two of our three enemies lie among the ruins of their own evil ambitions. We have come far along the road since those early perilous days that shook the world. I salute the members of the armed forces of the United States for courage and complete devotion to duty throughout the African and European campaigns. I salute the men in uniform ashore, afloat, or aloft in the vast Pacific, in India, China, and Burma. For well, the fact is that we have been fighting not two wars, but one global war, a global war in which, at the darkest hour, our Axis enemies were striking eastwards and westwards halfway across the world and threatened to join forces in the Middle East, thus isolating China and Russia. Had that effort been successful, the combined strength of the Axis coalition could then have been directed at the destruction of the free nations of the world one by one. We have therefore to consider the possibility that after the conquest of Asia, Africa, and Europe, Germany might engulf the British Isles and that she might then join with Japan in attacks on our coastal cities and industries. By that time, we would have been fighting alone and virtually surrounded. The outlook was serious and a grave decision had to be made. Therefore, our strategy was, first, to prevent at all costs the junction of Germany and Japan, and second, to crush them one at a time. We had to destroy the Nazis first because until the great industries of our country could perform the modern miracle of building sufficient ships for all-out war, it was necessary to choose the considerably shorter supply routes to European theaters in preference to the longer sea lanes of the Pacific. Furthermore, to have undertaken an early offensive against Japan would have required large naval forces. The treacherous attack on Pearl Harbor had so damaged our fleet as to render us unable to assume that offensive. The naval building program would need at least two years to complete. We simply couldn't wait that long. In Europe, we had hard-fighting allies already at grips with the enemy. In England, we had bases from which to launch our fast-growing air power. But in the Pacific, we had no air bases near Japan and no strong allies, however brave. But most important of all, America immediately had to commit its major forces to the European theater because at that time, the Axis partners had Russia and Britain on the ropes. If we had concentrated on Japan and defeated it, we then might have been confronted with a Germany that either had defeated Russia and Britain or, at the very least, had become so strong as to be almost impregnable to our delayed attack. Particularly if the enemy had gained possession of the British and French fleets, we then would have faced long years of constant wars. Thus, we made the choice. Hold in the Pacific, attack in Europe. First, we would attack Germany from the air. Then we would invade Europe and destroy the German armies. True with our allies, we won the Battle of Europe. But without the heroism and sacrifice of our Pacific naval, air, and ground forces under splendid leadership, the success that now shines upon our banners in Europe would not have been possible. Our Pacific troops fought and held back a savage foe so that we might concentrate the full fury of our offensive power against Nazi Germany. Then as we gather the strength of the Pacific, they have closed in on the enemy, destroying his ships and planes in preparation for the final kill. We have won the Battle of Europe. But the war, the global war, will not be won until we have exterminated Japanese military power. Japanese of Pearl Harbor. Bataan. Corregidor. And Malaysia. And Japan committed to 100 years of war and sacrifice if necessary. 
we are prepared to lose 10 million lives in our war with America. Did Japan committed to world domination or to death? Japan, whose home front is fanatically united behind the enemy's war effort. Now, together with our allies, we shall concentrate devastating power against this treacherous enemy and rid the world permanently of this menace of barbarism. We can do this if every American, in or out of uniform, keeps in heart and mind the plain fact that we will not have won this war, nor can we enjoy any peace until Japan is completely crushed. Two down and one to go. To defeat Japan as quickly as we can, but permanently, we must now assemble, readjust, and streamline our world forces in order to apply the maximum power. In striking this last great blow, will we need all our present military personnel to bring about the showdown in the Pacific. Military necessity decrees that all men suited to the type of warfare to be waged against the Pacific foe must remain in service as long as they are essential. However, certain kinds of troops will not all be needed to meet the vast but special demands of the Pacific theater. With this in mind, the War Department for some months has been formulating a plan for the return of non-essential soldiers to civilian life. Briefly, the plan is this. Men surplus to the needs of each overseas theater and the continental United States will be assembled in the U.S. From among these men, some will be designated essential, and a substantial number will be designated as non-essential to the new military needs of the Army as a whole and will be returned to civilian life according to certain priorities. Taking the European theater as an example, the War Department has informed the commanding general of that theater of the types and numbers of his units which are needed in the Pacific, and the types and numbers of his units which will remain as occupation troops, and the types and numbers of his units which have now become surplus. To return these surplus units as is to the United States with their present personnel, would be the simplest and easiest method. However, the War Department does not believe this to be the fairest method. The fairest method is to select the surplus men from throughout the theater as individuals, using thoroughly impartial standards. To help arrive at such fair and impartial standards, the War Department has conducted test polls among the men in the armed forces. Experts were sent into the field to obtain a cross-section of the sentiments of American enlisted men everywhere, who voiced their opinions anonymously and freely. Let the men who have been in the Army longest out first. Why not let men with dependents out first? I think the men who have served overseas should get out first. Let the men over 30 out first. I'm in favor of letting men with children out first. Let the men with dependents out first. Men who have served overseas. Men who have served overseas. Men who have been in the Army longest. Men with dependents, men with children who have served overseas. By overwhelming majorities, the worldwide poll showed that enlisted men everywhere thought that men who have served overseas and men with dependents should be the first to be returned to civilian life. With a thorough study, the War Department has worked out a plan which best meets the test of justice and impartiality. As part of the plan, this adjusted service rating card will be issued and you will be scored on the four factors that will determine your priority of separation. These are one, service credit, which is based upon the total number of months of Army service you have had since September 16, 1940. Two, overseas credit, which is based upon the number of months you have served overseas. Three, combat credit, which will give you credit for the number of bronze service stars you've earned, as well as additional credit for other decorations. Four, parenthood credit, which will give you credit for each dependent child under 18 years, up to a limit of three children. This is the way it works. Suppose you've been in the Army 19 months since September 16, 1940. Across from service credit, 19 will be put in column one 
under the heading number. In column two, under multiply by, will be put a number which the theater commander will give you. Suppose the number is one. One is put in column two. In column three, under credits, you put column one multiplied by column two. In this case, it would be 19. Across from overseas credit in column one is put the number of months you've spent overseas. In this case, suppose it's 14. In column two, you again put down a number which the theater commander will give you. In this case, suppose it's two. In column three, you multiply 14 by two and put down 28. Combat credit. Suppose you've been in two separate campaigns and are entitled to two bronze service stars. And suppose also you've won the Purple Heart. That gives you three decorations. Under column one, you put down three. For column two, suppose the theater commander announces the number three. Column three will be three times three or nine. If you have two children under 18, a two is put in column one across from parenthood credit. In column two, suppose the theater commander says the number is four. Then column three would be two times four or eight. Adding up all your credits in column three, you get a total of 64. This is your priority credit score. This is the score that will be used to select out surplus men from the theaters and the United States. This is also the score that will be used when a certain portion of all these surplus men will be declared non-essential and return to civilian life. Remember, the numbers put down here under column two are just hypothetical. Your theater commander will announce to you the exact numbers to put in this column. They will be the same all over the world. Then, whether you make out your own score or it is made out for you, you will understand it and know where you stand in relation to the men about you. Thus, the plan of reduction, as it will ultimately work out, will separate from the Army chiefly those men with overseas and combat service. Yet, will provide an extra opportunity for separation for those men with dependent children. You may ask, how will this affect me? I must emphasize to you the fact that in all cases, the demands of military necessity and the needs of the war against Japan must first be met. It is important that this phrase, military necessity, be thoroughly understood. It is unfortunate, but true, that regardless of priority standing, certain types of units and certain types of personnel can never become surplus as long as the war against Japan continues because of the needs and nature of that war. Let us hear from General Henry H. Arnold in regard to how the plan will apply to the Air Forces. Men of the Army Air Forces, you have smashed your opponents in Europe. You have succeeded magnificently, and we are proud of you. Now we must smash Japan. We must carry the war to every part of her empire, no matter how remote our tactical operations and our strategic bombardment must be closely coordinated with the efforts of the ground and sea forces in the all-out invasion of Japan. That is where you come in. An overwhelming air force in the Pacific is indispensable. So what have we to do? We must concentrate our air strength against Japan in the shortest possible time. Because of the great distances in the Pacific, it will take more than twice as many planes and men to drop a thousand tons of bombs on Japan as was required in our bombing of Germany. As we approach Tokyo, our task becomes far more complicated. New air bases must be established on the Asiatic mainland and on the captured islands adjacent thereto. Many of these bases must be supplied by air. We will run into violent opposition, and yet Japan is wide open for aerial bombardment. Her cities are far more concentrated than those of Germany. She cannot disperse. With all our air strength, Japan can be defeated in the shortest time and the least cost to American lives. Now, to answer your question, will any of the men from the Air Forces 
be released. Yes, they will. But only after the Air Forces have moved combat groups and supporting ground forces from various parts of the world into the Pacific area. Men will be released as fast as they can be replaced by men from the ground forces or by new inductees. But remember, only after they have been replaced. Eventually, men of the Air Forces will be replaced in the same ratio as men from other branches of the Army. But most of us will be required by military necessities to remain until the job is completed. General Jimmy Doolittle began the bombardment of Japan with a handful of planes. We are going to finish it with a skyfall. How will the War Department's plan for separating non-essential men operate in regard to the service forces? General Brian Somerville has a message concerning this. So far, you men of the service forces have accomplished miracles. Miracles in supply, in construction, in communications, in transportation, in sanitation and health. But our job is tougher in the Pacific. One service force man could keep two and a half men firing in Europe. In the Pacific, one service force man can keep only one and a half men firing. Supply lines are longer. Our bases are more widely scattered. We'll find no ready-made cities and roads and power plants. We'll have to construct our own roads, our own communication lines through the most primitive kind of country. We'll have to hack base after base out of swamp and jungle. And with every step forward, greater medical and sanitation problems arise. We take our kind of world right along with our army. This means that the work of the Army Service Forces is of the greatest immediate importance. Therefore, reduction in its strength must be slow at first. More and more men will be separated as readjustments in the Army take place. But right now, beating the Jap is number one priority. We'll find nothing ready-made for us in the Pacific, nothing but tough assignments. There'll be plenty of them. We in the service forces must get them behind us before our job is done. Lieutenant General Leslie J. McNair of the Ground Forces said a few words shortly before he gave his life for his country on the Normandy front. The plan is to move against Japan with all the strength that we can employ effectively. The more overwhelmingly we tackle them, the sooner the job will be finished and the fewer will be the losses. Some must be transferred from one branch of the army to another in order to balance the new forces. Some will not be needed and may go home. I know that ground forces everywhere are going to rise to this new demand and see the entire war through to a finish that is a finish. You will now see how the readjustment of the army, based on military necessity, will take place on a worldwide scale. For simplicity of explanation, we will describe its workings in each of the three types of theaters that now exist. These are one, an inactive overseas theater, such as the European or Caribbean. Two, an active overseas theater, such as the Southwest Pacific or China, Burma, India. And three, the continental United States. Let us examine an inactive overseas theater like the European first. The War Department has given the commanding general of that theater his new troop strength and has made known to him the numbers and types of units which are now surplus. These will be units of various types, such as armored divisions, artillery battalions, infantry divisions, ordnance companies, or other units as the case may be. Let us take the infantry as an example, and let us assume that there are four infantry divisions in the theater, and that one division has become surplus. The theater commander will then grade the men in all four divisions, according to priority credit scores. 
select out the top fourth and designate these men as surplus. He will then shift all the men remaining in the surplus division who are not surplus into the active divisions and then transfer all the surplus men into the surplus division, which will now serve as a vehicle for eventually returning them to the United States. Remember, however, military necessity governs this selection and transfer. That means no man in a unit that remains in service can become surplus until a qualified replacement is available. If military necessity should entail the immediate transfer of a certain unit to the Pacific, there may conceivably be no time to apply the plan to men of that unit before the emergency transfer is made. Consideration will be given these men when they arrive in the new theater. The same processes will take place among all other types of surplus units in the theater. But in all cases, the type of men that will be declared surplus will be determined by the type of unit that becomes surplus. The active units needed against Japan will now be shipped to the Pacific. Those units required for occupation duty will be sent to their stations. The surplus units will be returned to the United States as quickly as possible. In the United States, the men of these surplus units will revert back to a surplus pool in the ground forces, air forces, or service forces, as the case may be. It is from these surplus pools that the planned reduction of various types of army personnel will be made. The number to be returned to civilian life as no longer essential to overall army needs will be chosen from among those with the highest priority credit scores. However, the rate of return of surplus men from overseas will depend upon the number of ships that can be spared over and above the thousands of ships required to supply our fighting theater in the Pacific. The Pacific theater is number one priority. All else must wait. To it, we must transport millions of fighting men Millions of tons of landing barges, tanks, planes, guns, ammunition, and food. Over longer supply lines than we had to Europe. This means that most of the ships and planes that were used to supply the once active European theater will now be needed to supply the active Pacific areas. The majority of ships that do proceed to Europe will continue on to the Pacific, laden with troops and supplies for that distant campaign very few will turn around and come back to the United States. That is why we cannot return all the surplus men to the United States at one time, and why it may take many months. However, during the time that such men are waiting their turn to go home, a complete program of educational and vocational training will be available to them. While this process of selecting and returning surplus men from the European theater is taking place, the plan for readjustment will also be applied in the active overseas theaters like the Southwest Pacific. Men in those theaters will be declared surplus to the extent that replacements can be provided. Naturally, since the Pacific is now the only active area, we know there are no surplus units of any type there. Military requirements there will demand an increase rather than a decrease in fighting units. Nevertheless, troops in the Pacific area will benefit by the reduction of the army, not as units, but as individuals. The commanding general of each active Pacific theater has been allotted his quota of the numbers and types of men who can be replaced. And he will select these men using the same standards you have seen to determine priority of return. These men will then be returned to the United States as rapidly as replacements of the same type become available and as the military situation will permit. To take the infantry again as an example, Normally, there will be a great flow of men needed to build up and maintain an offensive against Japan. But if, say, 5,000 infantry replacements over and above the normal number can be shipped to the Pacific, then 5,000 infantrymen with the highest priority credit scores can be declared surplus and returned to the ground forces surplus pool in the United States, where their scores will determine whether they are to be among that number of infantrymen no longer essential to the Army. Simultaneously with the selection and return of men in the overseas theaters, the same process will be taking place among the troops stationed in the continental United States. Frankly, the troops in the United States will serve as the main reservoir of replacements for the overseas theaters, for in general, their priority credit scores will be lower than the scores of men who have served overseas and seen combat duty. However, very much as in the European theater, the unit system will apply in the United States. 
The commanding generals of the three forces that comprise the army, ground, service, and air, have already been given both the numbers and types of individuals within their commands who have become surplus or can be replaced. They will transfer their surplus men to the surplus pools for designation as essential or non-essential, as you have seen. Also, if any man who may have been declared non-essential under this plan wishes to remain in the army, such a man will not be forced out if he can be usefully employed. In the case of the Army's officers, military necessity will determine which ones are non-essential. They will be separated only as they can be spared. And our Women's Army Corps has not been forgotten. The Women's Army Corps is an integral part of our armed forces, and the priority for release among its members will be determined just as in the rest of the Army, but treating the Corps as a separate group. Credit will be given for time served in the former Women's Auxiliary Army Corps. However, soldiers of the Women's Army Corps, whose husbands have already been separated from the Army, will be discharged upon application. You now have seen how the worldwide readjustments in the Army will take place. The surplus men from all overseas theaters and the continental United States will be reassembled under their respective commands in the United States surplus pools. There will be some reduction in the ground force there will be somewhat less reduction in the service forces. There will be practically no immediate reduction in the air forces. But as replacements become available from the ground forces and from new inductees, the air forces and service forces will separate a share of men proportionate with the ground forces. You also know that wherever possible, the men to be returned to civilian life will come from among those with the highest priority credit scores based on total service, overseas service, combat service, and number of dependent children up to three. You also know that the great majority of men to be released will come from overseas. Those who must stay on the active scene have a mean job to do, but we shall do it as Americans and in the tradition of the American soldier. It is not a question of whether we will win, but only of how quickly and how thoroughly we can do the job. Upon you, the men who remain in active service, destiny of peoples and of nations depends. Others who come after you may read history. Others may write it. But you men will make history. Two down and one to go. Now to make it three. 